again, welcome to everybody. Uh, this is a, a program, the Lunch and Learn series, is something we started earlier this year um, as, a, as a trial to see if anybody would like to have these monthly sessions. So the topics vary each month. So we're really glad you're here for our uh, Veteran Summit. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce our speakers. They're gonna give presentations and then facilitate questions. So feel free, if you have a question at any time, raise your hand. If you'd like to come up and ask your question, we can do that or I'll be wandering around with the mic. So just flag me down and I'll, I'm happy to uh, have you ask your question. So without further ado, let's talk about who we're going to be hearing from today. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Deanne Bonner Simpson. She's a lawyer and her law practice focuses on the legal issues of veterans and their families, most commonly VA service-connected disability claims, surviving spouse benefits, and military records corrections. She's the practice partner for Legal Help for Veterans and she represents her clients nationally at VA regional offices, the Board of Veterans' Appeals, and the U.S. Court of Appeals. She's chair of the Michigan Military Appeals Tri Tribunal, which was appointed by uh, Governor Whitmer, and is a member of the National Organization of Veterans Advocates. She's a proud military spouse. Her husband has served over 25 years of active duty in the Army and Michigan Army National Guard. So please help me welcome Deanne Bonner Simpson. And then our second speaker is going to be uh, Brigadier General Carol Ann Fasson. Uh, General Fasson has been a nurse for over 40 years. She served her country for 36 years and retired in 2011. She now owns The Veterans Advocate, a business that consults uh, in matters related to VA healthcare and education. She was approved in 2016 as a service disabled veteran owned small business. She also helps direct individuals, uh, individual veterans to resources and benefits. She works part-time at Legal Help for Veterans as its Chief Fix-It Officer on VA roadblocks. She was selected as a notable veteran by Crane's Detroit Business in 2020. Please help me welcome uh, Brigadier General Carol Ann Fasson. <laughs> Deanne, why don't you take it away? Coming. We had a really good turnout today, and we're happy to be here. It's a little bit different format than um, the Veteran Summits in the past, but um, we're happy to attend and get this important information out to everybody. I'm just going to get a little closer. Thank you. I'm afraid it's going to be too loud. Okay. Um, so, Carol Ann Fasson, General Fasson, and I work together um, at Legal Help for Veterans, where we represent veterans and mostly service connected disability benefits and also a lot of survivor benefit claims and appeals. Um, the, probably the biggest news right now in service connection is uh, the PACT Act, which you guys might have heard about. But uh, essentially, the uh, main changes are huge, which, which have to do with burn pits. That's the biggest change. Um, there's over 20 new presumptive service connection conditions. And what that means is the veteran no longer has to prove that they were exposed to something that caused their condition that they're disabled by. So now, if you were in the geographic locations, which is essentially um, Gulf War era, Middle East and Somalia, post 9-11, Southwest Asia and Uzbekistan. If you were in those locations, you were presumed to be exposed to these um, contamination burn pits, the particulates that cause certain diseases. And now there's these 23, actually 25 now, service connected conditions that you don't have to prove anymore. If you were there, and if you have the condition, a diagnosis of it, that is enough to establish service connection. And, and Deanne, the, the biggest thing in audience, veterans, and your family, is in the PACT Act, it also um, presumed a couple other conditions from Agent Orange. And so that was huge, too. This is the first time since, I think, 2010 that this many um, presumptives have been approved in one act. We haven't seen this ever before. And so I think it's extremely significant. They also in the PACT Act um, identified some places of radi radionizing radiation. Um, and uh, 
and back in the Vietnam era. So there is some significant implications with this PAC Act. And that's what we wanted to talk about today to make you aware of some of this coming about. How many of you have heard about this and what it might mean to you? Show of hands, please. Okay. Okay, probably about half. Yep. And I'm not surprised because it really is huge yeah. news. And like Caroline said, we've never before seen this many presumptive conditions added um, for service connection disability. The Agent Orange conditions are, one is hypertension, yes. which um, is a claim that we've seen many, many times in the past, which we were, have been wondering when the VA was going to recognize this as presumptive. That's now been added. Um, and the MGUS. MGUS, which is, um, maybe I'll it, defer to my medical It relates to your here. blood, yeah. and it relates to protein, and the producing and the lack of producing of protein, but it's all related to Agent Orange. Um, and so I think it's really significant with any of these presumptives that if you already have a disability, um, claim out there or a benefit, you go back out and review what's been added because the majority of our veterans at the firm, and I think we're fourth largest in the country, um, people have had, you, you do have hypertension. It, it's a system um, and there's that link. And so you need to go back if you've been denied before, go back whether it's with a veteran service officer or if you deal with us, but you need to look at your claim Claim and what you have and peruse this, um, literally this act, and we'll talk about it. We've got some things out there that could literally, you could look online and see all of the presumptives and see if any of those are connect with you. And we're going to talk about another thing that just was coming up um, for your family. So yeah, and which what Caroline is referring to is uh, our ebooks, which yes. Caroline works hard on, and we do have they're available online. Um, it's a, it's an overview of, and the handout is every ebook that we've got. But these are our, our latest to the collection, which is our, our Agent Orange um, exposure ebook. There's the Burn Pit exposure and the. This one is another one that's been in the news a lot lately, which we want to talk about today. The Camp Lejeune water contamination um, and how that might affect you, depending on where you served. But these are really handy. All of the presumptive conditions are laid out there. Um, and your, your eligible service time periods, geographic locations, et cetera. Um, so I just want to circle back to the Agent Orange presumptives we were just talking about, the hypertension, and it's called monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, which is a lot easier to say as M-G-U-S. <laughs> um, but the implementation dates of these conditions are uh, in the future. So the MGUS is this October, October 1st of 2022, the, the PAC Act allows veterans to make claims for presumptive service connection as of October 1st, 2022. Hypertension is a, is a little bit further down the road, October 1st, 2026 for presumptive service connection. However, if a veteran or a surviving spouse um, has some compelling circumstances, there's five exceptions where you can apply right away. If someone is terminally ill, if they're homeless, have an extreme financial hardship, um, if they're more than 85 years old, and, and then the last one is capable of demonstrating other sufficient cause. So you, you have some compelling circumstance in your life where you need this thing decided soon. It's okay to apply now. Um, any one of those five. Otherwise, if a veteran doesn't fall into one of those five categories, for the Agent Orange presumptives, it's October 1st of 22 for MGUS and October 1st of 26 for hypertension. That's for applications. Now, that's just for presumptive service connection. You can still apply mm -hmm. on what they call a direct service connection basis. And what that means is 
you have evidence to show that, like your doctor wrote a note, you have, or some other medical evidence showing that your currently diagnosed condition is related to service, Agent Orange exposure or otherwise. So you don't have to wait to apply, but that's just when the presumption comes into play, where you no longer have to present your own evidence to make that connection. And, and I think it's real important as a nurse, okay, um, and I alluded to it before, if things happen to you, you've got cardiac issues, you've got respiratory issues, um, you've got the neuropathy, you have diabetes from Agent Orange, I, I would bet you lunch that you're going to have hypertension, you might have some Parkinson's. These are um, all related. They call it nexus. And our legal, our legal team is the best to pull all of these stories together. They've got significant evidence of what's been already approved. They know all the law. And we're, we're getting, at a very high rate, a lot of these approved, as Deanne was saying. But the most important thing, and I'm glad to see I'm presuming some spouses in the room, it's to push the veteran to apply. I, I hear that all the time. Well, I don't want to take it away from somebody else. But what I say to the veteran is, you've got a family. Um, leave that legacy. And as we're going to talk about soon, Camp Lejeune, which is also big brand news, is that one will affect families. I've never seen this ever before. Families are now able to claim and submit bills for the injuries from, from Camp Lejeune, besides the lawsuit that you're hearing out there. Um, so if you don't ask, if you don't come to the table, uh, we can't help you. Um, and, and I think that's really significant. And that's what I tell every veteran that's out there. You know, if you have a disability and your conditions are getting worse, contact somebody, whether it's a veteran service organization, if you go to one of our great VA medical centers, and we are so fortunate in Michigan to have the ones we have, please make sure you're enrolled and that gets done. And I'm very happy to see one of our outstanding VSOs and organizations is on the Zoom, and that's Michael Harris. Michael, wave your arm. That's with paralyzed veterans. Michael is phenomenal. Um, PVA is super in Michigan. So there are so many resources. But you could lead the horse to water but you can't make them drink sometimes. So please, um, please ask the questions. Deanne? Yep, and I just, I think that um, probably the last most important point on the Agent Orange that's new Impact Act that may affect some of you is the geographic locations now. So you might be familiar with the history of this. Initially, um, the VA gave a presumption of Agent Orange exposure to veterans who were in Vietnam proper and in the water, then they took away the blue water. Now, thank goodness, that has been returned. Um, so you've got Republic of Vietnam, you've got Blue Water Navy, which is 12 nautical miles off of Vietnam and some parts of Cambodia. Okay, now you also have Thailand. Any US um, base or Royal Thai Air Force Base during um, the Vietnam era, you are presumed to have been exposed to Agent Orange. Also, Cambodia, um, at certain locations in Cambodia, and Guam, American Samoa, and Johnson Atoll, which is a small, um, tiny island yep. out in the Pacific Ocean, but we had our uh, service members there, and they were exposed um, between 1972 and 1977 to Agent Orange. So these are new locations. It's really important to understand that because a lot of people think, well, I wasn't in Vietnam, you know, proper, so I probably don't qualify. Now the VA has recognized these other places where we know we had people uh, during that era who are now presumed to be exposed to Agent Orange. So that's, that's a real game changer too. And don't forget the biggest point, 
Deanne, for the Air Force is they also approved air and the planes. And if you flew over those areas, if you remember, um, that was never approved before. So they come back to the base and the mechanics and the people on the ground now, they were exposed to the Agent Orange that was on the planes as you're foaming them down and cleaning them up. So this PACT Act, I can't tell you how huge it is um, and what it means for veterans. And don't be fooled. I, you know, when somebody says, well, how come it's taken so long? It, Agent Orange took years, 20, 30 years to get approved. I think finally our country and legislation saw that they can't wait around for burn pits that long. Our veterans have served um, and they have suffered and it's about time for them to approve this. But everything is based on money. You are probably sitting out there and saying, hypertension is so huge, why is it going to take till 2026, October, to get, you know, this approved? It's, it's the cost. And hypertension is huge for our veterans. And so the payout that's going to yeah, go out. I mean, you have sometimes wonder why. Um, yeah. I know that was part of the discussion in you know, passing the law. But the one thing I wanna make sure to, to stress again is there are those five exceptions. So all of that was contemplated to make sure that people who are really, you know, maybe elderly, financially destitute, homeless, terminally ill, um, or have some other situation in their life where it's really imperative that this gets um, processed now, Legislation, the legislation contemplates that. So um, uh, the ins and outs of, of the process are, you know, I don't know how the sausage gets made exactly, but I, I am really happy with the result here because so many veterans are gonna benefit from it. Now, um, I also wanna mention one other geographic change, and this is for radiation exposure, so uh, changing topics a little, but for around the same Vietnam era. Yeah. Um, there's no additional uh, list of conditions, but now if you were in one of these locations, you're presumed to have the radi a radiation exposure that would um, allow you to apply for these presumptive conditions that were already on the books, which are, um, there were two. Uh, one is a uh, US Air Force B-52 bomber and refueling plane uh, incident in Spain, Palmoras, Spain, and there was uh, four ther thermonuclear weapons that um, there was, they call like a broken arrow event. Um, and then the other is a similar incident in Greenland at Tool Air Force Base. And both of these um, would be um, in one, the uh, Spain is 1966 to 67, and Greenland is for uh, about eight, nine months in 1968. So it's still that Vietnam era, um, but a different location and a different kind of exposure. But this is, this is what the PACT Act covers, is all of these you know, different kinds of um, exposures that are dangerous. Yes. So, um, but I think uh, what you were touching on, Carol Ann, the Camp Lejeune Water Contamination Act, and this is part of the PACT Act. Um, it was very broad. Um, so it's a whole other topic that you could do a whole other series on. But it's really important. I think the highlights are what you were alluding to before, Caroline, with the um, medical care. Medical care. Um, and we have, um, I think it's circulating just to show you what our e-books look like. And we're circulating right now the burn pit one and the Agent Orange one. And... Um, we have an additional one up here, up front, for the Camp Lejeune. But what's really important is, if you recall, going back 1953 to, I believe, the approval is um, 1987, um, where by families um, on Camp Lejeune Marine Base, they were exposed to the contaminated water. And it has proven that that is affecting the next generation um, uh, with illnesses. And in this 
legislation that's come about, they are um, encouraging families to look at this, file a claim. That hasn't ever been before um, that a family member could file a claim like that. They can, they can file a claim for health care. For health care. And I think that this is significant. I want to go back to one thing. Um, I was going to address this at the end, but I keep saying family. Um, you know, we wouldn't be um, our service, and Deanne's a good example. Her husband is back over the pond again. Um, someplace. We tease about it someplace out there, um, but he's back serving our country. And while we were serving, our family is at home. So to see this benefit finally at a camp, at Camp Lejeune, um, our family members have suffered. But going back to a disability claims, if there is a claim that's in, or if your loved one, the veteran, dies because of Agent Orange, Camp Lejeune, um, burn pits. Um, when the veteran, there was always this rumor that when the veteran passes, dies, that the claim dies. And that's not true. I just believe, and Deanne does too, that the spouses do not know of the substitution rule. You could go in and now the spouse is the owner of that claim, and it's called substitution, but you have to do it within a year. And that sometimes is the disappointing thing. I just ran into a, a widow um, recently at an event like this, and she was crying at the end of the presentation. She was at the 15-month mark, and nobody told her. And there's nothing we can do. We can't go back. And it was significant. Um, it was for a lot of the things that have just been coming out of the PAC Act, she would, she would have been approved as the substitute. And then, and then the, the, other, the other thing that a lot of people don't know about is called DIC, death indemnity claim, compensation. And that is, if your veteran died, this is for the widow, because of your service in Vietnam or the PAC Act, you were approved, um, the widow would need to apply for DIC. It just doesn't happen automatically. Ladies and gentlemen, the VA doesn't come to you and say, oh, you, you're eligible for this. Uh-uh. If you don't apply, you're not going to get it. And so no harm, no foul, I would tell you, take the energy and the time to start asking questions if you've never applied and you do think you qualify for any of these um, new issues, th these PAC Act issues. Yep, definitely. And the <clears throat> one thing that um, I want to add about the DIC is for these new Agent Orange presumptive conditions, the legislation has carved out an earlier effective date allowance. So that means only for DIC, but so for a surviving spouse or dependent child is also eligible for DIC. But for um, in that in that scenario, they if it's granted, that can go all the way back to the original date that a veteran applied, even if it had been denied and not appealed. But that is only for these um, Agent Orange uh, new presumptive conditions. So that's if if your veteran applied for hypertension ten years ago and was denied and never appealed, but later passed away and the hypertension was, you know, contributing cause of death, that DIC effective date will go all the way back to the original uh, claim date. So that's pretty significant. Um, and and D DIC doesn't have any um, length of exposure time where the substitution is only one year. Yes. The DIC that Deanne just talked about, that's huge. Um, it could be 10 years ago, and now they're identifying all these other issues. You could apply now for DIC. That's true. And the um, substitution that you're talking about, Carol Ann, is for what the VA calls accrued benefits. And essentially, that's a, something that was pending when the veteran passed away. So you're gonna step into the shoes of the veteran as a survivor, and whatever was pending until that's done, whether it's granted or there's, you know, ultimately you realize that wasn't a claim that could be granted. But if it was granted, 
that um, back pay that the veteran would have gotten paid goes to the survivor. And this is a substitution that uh, Carolina is referring to. So that's one year from the time that the veteran passes away, the surviving spouse has to substitute and um, a VSO or county veteran service officer, anybody can help you if you're not sure how to apply. Um, but that is from the date of the claim until the date of the veteran's death. So essentially that money that would have otherwise gone to the veteran, the survivor is entitled to if it's granted and they substituted. But you have to apply. Mm -hmm. Yes, they don't, you're right, they don't, they don't come and- Knock and, on your door yeah. and say you're eligible. So, um, but yeah, and so I don't know if, if we wanna um, touch on- I think we're good with time, Dave. We, okay. Show, we can take questions. Yeah. So I, I just wanna veer a little bit um, I think I alluded to it already, and I want to leave enough time for your questions, because I think that's really important. You came here, and you want to find out about some things. We want to see if we could help you, and if we can't answer you today, we'll get back to you as immediately as possible. But there's a couple other neat things you need to be aware of. So. I told you apply to the VA for health care. What we've been talking about mainly is VBA, the benefits arms. The VA has three silos, um, the benefits, the health care, and then they've got the burial, okay? So what I'm just gonna um, touch on just very quickly is health care. Um, I know people will say, I went in and I tried to enroll and they told me I make too much money. Um, when you're going after a disability claim, they will never ask you how much money you make. Um, but the beautiful thing is with health care, the minute you start, and I don't want to say racking up disability benefits, but at a 30% mark, you could add your spouse if you have a spouse and dependent children under 18. If you're at 50%, you could get all of your health care through the VA. At 70% of a disability benefit, you get now long-term care, you have to apply, but as we all know, the, the cost of health care, nursing homes, skilled nursing, it's extensive. Once you're at the 70% mark, then you're good to go to apply to the VA and they could potentially pick up that bill for long-term care. When you're at 100% with your disability benefit, there's a few other things that come into play that sometimes people aren't even aware of. And we've tried to address over the years um, all of these critical issues through the e-books. Please, as you're walking out, make sure you pick up our handout. Every e-book is free. Um, you could go in and, and pick up huge information. I ran in, believe it or not, one of the benefits um, when you're 100% and you own a home is the tax exemption. And I ran into a veteran out here who couldn't stay for here, but he was returning his letter. He reached 100%, and then that also will go to the spouse if the veteran dies in that household. But think about your taxes. Once you get, you have to apply once again. You sound like a poly parrot, but they won't just call you and give it to you. You have to come in and see your tax assessor here um, in Canton, and then uh, if, if this is where you reside, and then uh, that's another unbelievable benefit. So there are things out there, but you have to keep maybe asking questions or finding out what you're eligible for. But um, just raising the questions, we are very fortunate in this area. Um, you, we have a brand new CBOC, a Canton CBOC, um, and if you haven't gone, please go in if you're eligible. This is phenomenal. What they are trying to do is do the reach with health care so you don't CBOC, have to go. Yeah, CBOC is um, out 
patient clinic based um, community-based community -based service, and it's outstanding. Um, they're usually um, 25,000 square feet or greater where you could get lab work, x-rays, primary care. Some of them all deal differently depending on um, your venue. Some have mental health, um, so they're phenomenal. And the and, Canton Seabuck falls under the Ann Arbor VA yes, hospital. Yes, and every um, major VA medical Center, which Ann Arbor. Um, so then the Canton Seabock, there's a Flint Seabock. They've just opened up, they'll be opening up a brand new one in Howell. Um, and so they, the Seabocks belong to a VA medical center. And then you've got vet centers underneath that. That's called the echelon of care um, that you would receive. And hopefully, um, if you are enrolled in the VA and you're receiving care through the VA, you know your team, your color, um, your social worker, you know what, how to reach them. And I think that that is so critical. I'm talking really fast because uh, I know the time. Um, you were mentioning always ask questions. Always ask questions. So why don't we open it up? That sounds great okay. segue. If you have a question, why don't you just raise your hand. I'm gonna walk around with the mic here and uh, we can get you set up. And don't be shy, and if you don't have questions and they stop and we'll look at who's on Zoom, I, I've got a whole bunch of other things to tell you that are, I don't wanna say trivia, but I think it's really important um, to help you navigate the VA, um, which isn't always easy. Yes, sir. When you were talking about the disabilities, you mentioned that 30% the family becomes eligible. Eligible for what? I, the veteran, you lost me. Sure. Do you mind if I take that one? Yeah, take okay. it. So once a veteran is rated for their service-connected disability benefit at 30%, if they have dependents, the monthly payment is increased, depending yes. on whether they have a spouse or children. children or a spouse and children. But you have to apply. Yes, you do. And um, hopefully, which the VA um, should do and normally does, is when a veteran reaches that 30% threshold, they would send you the form um, to return to them. And that is, you would have to give your dependence information, marriage certificate, birth certificate, and that kind of information. But it changes your monthly payment. In some cases, depending on uh, your rating, it can be significant. So in any case, that, yeah, that is what the 30%. So the, da the downside, and I, I need to say this because we've had to argue some of these. So you get your dependent on there and um, your dependent dies. You need to notify the VA or if we have the claim, you know, notify Legal Help for Veterans or a veteran service organization that's paperwork that has to go in and notifying them because you don't want to keep getting this money, I will tell you, it will catch up to you. We just recently had one really sad $18,000 because, and we were able to refute it because guess what? The mail got lost, we notified them three times, so it wasn't the veteran's fault. And so all of those things are significant. Um, but just call and ask us if you've got questions. Did that help you, sir? Yes, I was thinking something completely different. Okay, excellent. I saw another hand here, Navy? Let me bring the Wait. mic over to you. This is helpful because then we're not repeating the question. Oh, with that, you. I don't think that mic is working. That's okay. I can speak louder. Okay, I'm great. Okay, very good question. But I'll let the the lawyer handle this. But um, yeah, I'll let her handle it. Okay. Uh, no, there's no consultation fee, um, and um, for new claims, there are no attorney's fees. It's uh, pro bono for any new claim. For anything that is an appeal that we are able to work on and get that thing granted for you, there is a contingency fee of back pay. That means, a contingency fee means it's contingent on us winning. So assuming that we are able to get that granted for you and um, whatever your back pay is, it's a 20% contingency fee, which is actually a lot less than what 
normal contingencies fees are out there. Normally they're about a third. But um, that's only on the back pay and only if we win. So no, there's no uh, fee for consultation. There's no fee for a new claim uh, to be submitted. Um, the only time we would have an attorney fee involved is for work that we do that results in back pay for you. And so you're not putting in, and I, and I say this, and um, I think we're one of the best in the country. Um, we will get uh, veterans to come back and say, and, and I feel also bad about this one. You know, I applied for something, I got denied three times. The window of one year expired. And now the veteran, and sometimes it's the spouse that says, you know, he's got diabetes, he's got this, he's got that. Um, neuropathy, a secondary, and he got denied, denied. And so our first question is usually, oh, when's the last denial letter? And I try to get that, and then if it's greater than a year, we gotta start all over, which is really sad because now you can't go back to that initial time. So that's one of the things I really believe we try to do for you is to keep track of those so it doesn't fall through the cracks. As long as it's touched within a year, you know, your denial letter, we're keeping it open. And case in point, we had blue water, we had brown water, boots on the ground, um, many Agent Orange cases that the veteran now is being recognized with these presumptives and we're gonna go, be able to go back to the original date, like Deanne was talking about, that that claim went in. That's significant back pay for the veteran and their families. Hello, oh, you don't hear me. Um, I was in the service and I had, uh, we used to fly in and out of Vietnam all the time. I was around Agent Orange all the time. I was around Dangerous Cargo. I was on dead bodies all the time. And uh, on my, two, my DD-214, it doesn't state. It just states that the bases that I was assigned at, it doesn't state that I was in Vietnam. It doesn't state I was in Guam. It doesn't state any place else. It states Travis Air Force Base, and it also states Germany, where I mean Germany. So how can I prove that I was Here's, in the Sure. Your service records? should have a history yes. of wherever you were, including TDY. But if you are, if you were on a mission that went to Vietnam, it should be indicated um, on your service record. Um, do you remember the name of the form, Carol Ann? Um, the 93. Thank you. I knew you would know that. Um, and it lists from um, boot camp until you're discharged everywhere where you lo were located. So you would want to get your service records, and you can get those from the National um, Personnel Record Center with a form called the SF, standard form, 180. Yes. You can send that to St. Louis, to the National Personnel Record Center. It has the instructions where you mail it, depending on uh, your branch of service, and they will provide you with your service record. Your service record should show those places where you were um, so that you can establish it. Now, you can also establish it uh, other ways, um, just talking, to, you know, looking, telling them what your unit was and then telling them the time frame where you were in these places puts the VA on notice and they have to assist you. There's a, a law that is in place, it's called um, duty the to duty assist. to assist. So they have to assist you in establishing your claim. You're giving them this reasonable information that shows it's relevant. You give them the location, the time period, your unit. They have to go find those records to help you corroborate your claim. The other thing is, if you served with someone and you're still in touch with them, yep. you can submit a statement. They call it a buddy statement. A letter from someone you served with, a letter from your you know, commanding officer or first sergeant or somebody who knew you were there. Um, those things are also evidence that has to be weighed in, in addition to your own statements about where you were. The, the other benefit, and this isn't a plug, but um, when you're our client, you don't have to go out and search. We will get your medical records, we'll go through um, the, the resource center, we will apply and get 
all of that done for you. Um, you just need to give me your DD-214. Um, and if we, when we do this again, Beth, it's kind of interesting, because in the past, um, for our summits, I told people, bring me your DD-214, because that's your story. And it was pretty awesome. On a couple, we discovered somebody earned a Purple Heart, and he didn't get it. Um, you know, that he was already um, presumed, like you, sir, that you had traveled and he didn't even recognize what that one little piece of paper is. So here's another seg. If there is anything you need to do after today, if you do not have your DD-214, you need to get it because that is your story. It will help you get buried. It will help your family for benefits. Um, it is. It's your service record that I think sometimes people don't even realize what's on that one little piece of paper. Got a question here, Bill. Yes, sir. Uh, two things real quickly. Uh, one, for Navy veterans, I don't know about the other services. I was kept getting rejected saying I need to show my ship's position uh, for part of my claim. And through a friend, I found out there's a source called NAVSOURCE, N-A-V-S-O-U-R-C-E. And if you go to that, follow the steps, and it will tell you the exact dates that your ship was in the combat zone and making you eligible. Uh, the other thing is that... Uh, I filed a, a secondary claim. I'm already 80% disabled, but in January I had a stroke and I've had vision problems uh, after that. And uh, I would think the stroke would be connected to hypertension. But when I filed my secondary claim, they came back saying I had to cite a scientific study proving that after this amount of time, it was still connected to my exposure to Agent Orange. And I'm kind of lost at that. So is that the hypertension you mean? Is that the hypertension specifically that you're there, you're asking about? Or? Uh, yeah, I filed uh, for the stroke as, as being connected to hy hypertension. So yeah, what you need is a medical nexus. So that could be an opinion from your doctor who's- I sent that in. Okay. Well, I, we'd be happy to talk to you about it, if, if, or any VSO or your, your veterans, um, county veteran services. I would say at this point it might be a good idea to get some help with it, um, because now you're venturing into you know, the more kind of legal argument zone uh, versus just the, you know, on the face of the record, that should establish it. But whether it's a VSO or your county veteran services office or you want to call us for a free consultation, I would suggest that you talk to somebody at this point to help you de develop that. See, this is your, and thank you for speaking up. This is a great example. Um, he's already at 80%. I'm sorry for your stroke and thank you for your service. Um, but you brought up two critical points where we used to have to go back and pull out the sheet and which ship you were on and where you were there. A lot of the new presumptives and the new ruling in the PAC Act, you might not have to go through that anymore. So let the legal beagles research it because we're doing it all the time. So that's number one. Number two, with the stroke and, and any disability, there are these connections that um, jumping through hoops sometimes is, is pretty difficult if you're doing it by yourself. Now, I'm not saying you're not very knowledgeable. I'm not saying you haven't done a fine job if you got your 80% by yourself. But um, the law firm, our firm, Legal Help for Veterans, has been doing this for 27 years. Deanne, um, has been doing it for a long time. Um, I served for 36, but I've been with them now for 11 years and have picked up a lot of these nuances um, that, you know, you are, you served our country and you're entitled to this. And I would tell you, stay on it, 
eyes, um, some of the other effects that you might be going through with a stroke, you might not even realize it. Um, that you're eligible for doing a secondary nexus. Yeah, so I think just to, just on the broader topic of just secondary service connection that you raised, um, if you're already service connected for something such as diabetes, let's say, it's very common with the Agent Orange exposure, you're already service connected for that. If another condition is later diagnosed as a result of your diabetes, you don't have to go through all of that proving the direct service connection anymore. You've already gotten your service connection for diabetes. It's enough for your doctor to say, this is kidney failure as a result of diabetes. This is a stroke as a result of diabetes. Neuropathy. Or neuropathy um, as a result of diabetes. If it's already service connected, up here, you got your diabetes, and then you have conditions down here, you don't have to go through that whole process again of establishing your primary service connection. So that's something that you just really need your diagnosis from your doctor to be able to do. And as Dave is walking back there, two points with any disability rating. If it gets worse, you need to contact us, do the same process again, because if it gets worse. Another thing that discourages our veterans, so you get a rating decision, and a couple things are approved, and you get something like sleep apnea, and it's 0% service connected. Uh, we'll get veterans all the time, oh my God, I can't believe I got 0%. Well, the 0% means you're not getting any money. But more importantly, I try to stress, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, whatever, if the condition gets worse, you got 0%. They're giving you or acknowledging this occurred because of your service. So you don't have to fight it anymore. They've given you 0%, it is service connected, because with the disability rating, that's all that we do is try to say, you got this because of your service. And I think that's really critical. So if something gets, a condition worsens, as in this case, something else happens, let the, the system, the VSO, or us or somebody know that you need to look at this condition and potentially put in another claim. You can always request a higher rating yes. if it changes. Let and me add one thing to that. Sure. Save every scrap of paper you give to the VA. Every scrap. <laughs> It'll come in handy someday, I can guarantee it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we need to repeat that. Yes, and um, it was a little bit hard to hear what you said, so I'm just gonna repeat your question. If a veteran is service-connected for cancer um, and has a 100% rating, and it later goes into remission, can the 100% be reduced? And the answer is yes, it can. Um, because the rating is associated with the severity of your condition. So if a veteran has active, let's say, prostate cancer, and they're service connected. They had Agent Orange exposure. They're now found to be service connected. If that goes into remission, the cancer itself may be reduced even to zero. But it, it, if it's not actively cancerous, it won't be 100%. However, you have um, residuals. So a, with most cancers, unfortunately, people suffer from other conditions that are associated. So you can still claim the residuals of um, whatever type of cancer it may be. So let's say if somebody had a tumor in their lung and they had surgery, maybe part of their lung is now gone because of the surgery. That's a residual of the cancer. So the cancer itself may, may no longer be 100%, but there are other conditions related to the cancer that can be separately compensated and have a separate rating. I think this lady up front, Dave. Hi. Um, I want to confirm that if someone is 100% regarding camp, uh, Agent R Orange uh, due to heart condition and stroke, or, well, heart condition and surgery, but now there's other conditions that perhaps are qualifiable under Camp Lejeune, can you get money on top of that 100%? No. no. It's just 100% is the maximum rating. 
So there is nothing beyond the 100% um, in the schedule of ratings. There are things that you can get, though, that are different than the schedule of ratings, which is called special monthly compensation. And that is something where a veteran service-connected condition causes additional hardships in their life. Maybe they're, um, in, they can't leave their home, or they need aid and attendance um, with their uh, daily living. Um, there are different scenarios, but that, that is a compensation that's beyond a 100% rating, but you can't get more than 100% just for the rating. You could get a service connection granted, but it wouldn't result in any more than 100% in your regular okay. um, pay that you get each month. So, and, and I, Deanne could really address this um, probably better than I, but when you're at 100 percent, you could be deemed total and permanent, which means they won't reduce you. You don't have to go back for any more exams um, because when you're called back for an exam and you're total and permanent, you need to get on the horn and stop that because once you get an exam, they could take it away. So. What I'm telling you is, um, in addition to your question, so if you're not total and permanent and you're sitting at 100% and now you see more of these presumptives coming about, put in the claim until you're total and permanent because you could get other um, disability claims granted, other diseases granted. And so then if they took something off, um, reduced one of your disabilities, you might have some stuff in the backyard that's going to kick in that you could remain at 100%. Because if you drop down from that 100%, going back on the, on the side of notification, um, and that means you need to notify, let's say, Canton, if you were getting property tax abatement and now you've lost your 100%, uh, you better be on the horn to them because then, you know, a couple years in arrears, taxes, they'll come after you. I, and I, I'm sorry to be, you know, negative, but I'm trying to give you both sides of the story. I think that's a really practical advice, actually. Yeah, so I, if, you know, just, just answering your question, do you get more money? No. no. However, really practical advice from, from General Fasson, Go after you if you're already service connected and one of them gets reduced you've got something else that could essentially fill the gap if you're not total and permanent but if you are total and permanent you're good that's exactly as it says total and permanent it's not going away and the other thing about total and permanent if it goes back 10 years at the time a veteran passes then the uh, surviving spouse yes. has a higher um, they have a benefit that comes yes. out of that that's a, it's additional money that comes out of that yes ma'am It's, if the cancer is in remission, then that is what you should expect. However, I would highly uh, encourage your husband to talk someone about residuals, um, the the surgery that you're describing, um, the the taking of you know part of his lung. Um, he's got reduced lung capacity. There are other potential claims there for the residuals. I mean, he has gotten a blood disease and he has had a heart attack. So mm -hmm. That in and of itself is something I would encourage you to look into in I, terms of the rating. I, I agree. Proper. Yes, sir. Uh, 1970, came back to the world and went to the Ann Arbor VA and to get some help with the malaria. 
three of us on our, our team picked it up in Cambodia. And it would be a two month wait before I could get any help. And then they looked at my 214 and said, oh, you gotta do a psych bell. And if I'd throw out a hundred bucks, they'd move me up on the list. Is that still going on? Absolutely not. That shouldn't have happened. It, it shouldn't have happened and I'm sorry. Because when any PJ that was in country, Air Force, had to do a psych bell at Beale, but that didn't count up there. I've never been back since that happened, never. You need to go back, and, uh, and I'd be happy to escort you there because that's not happening today. And I'm gonna tell you this, and Mike Harris, if you could pipe in, I believe the Ann Arbor VA is one of the best VAs in the country. Um, I'm, I'm gonna tell you sometimes, you know, people have a bad day, okay. But that, what occurred in 1970, does not exist today. Air Force said I wasn't nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do we have any questions from? Yes, yes sir. Um, I'm currently taking care of my father, who was in the Korean War. Um, he hasn't. He wasn't really disabled. He did have an accident on a motorcycle, but uh, they deemed it wasn't a wartime uh, thing. But uh, we heard there was some care that we can get daily care for him but all the forms I filled out and sent to Wisconsin and I just haven't had much luck. Is that something you guys could help with? He fix it officer. I, I probably get about, that's called aid in attendance. And um, does your dad, may I ask you, and thank you for being a great son to help because that's not an easy process, aid in attendance. Um, does he have any disability right now at all? No, 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 no. Uh, a disability rating. I'm. Dementia, basically. No rating from okay. VA or okay. So he is still entitled to the aid and attendance. It makes a difference if he was rated, and I still could help you. I would go back in and see if we could increase the what Deanne referred to special monthly compensation. So when I start to peel the onion back with the story with a veteran. I ask a lot of questions um, because it helps me navigate which path to go down. Um, but please, see me after. Um, I've had great success with the aid in attendance. At some point, it was about 13 months. And what aid in attendance is for is not to pay the rent in a nursing home. It's for the um, health care needs, if somebody's coming in with home health care, if they have to be placed in a nursing home that needs um, medical attention, um, there's a whole list of things. Then you apply. Now, this is income-based, so you have to look at all of that, and that's where it becomes tricky, but we can talk after. Um, I know, Dave, we're getting pretty close on time, so... We've got time um, for one more question, if, if there's, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, th all the advertisements for the lawyers who just can't wait to be involved in this and get some monies from, uh, f from the diseases. I mean, what, what? Being a spouse and then having to try to kind of catch me up on all of this, uh, it looks really inviting. Like, oh my God, money, money signs are coming up in my head. Uh, but you got to look beyond that. And so like, I want to know what is going on because there's a lot of confusion. Right now, the, what you might be referring to is the um, Camp Lejeune water contamination yeah. class yeah. action. Okay. I have seen a lot of those myself. Um, looking for the Michigan game last weekend, every channel yep. you know, that I was clicking through, it was uh, Camp Lejeune water contamination. So uh, a class action is a lawsuit in a federal court. And that is different than what we do. So we, we represent veterans on these disability claims, not the lawsuit. However, 
we do work with reputable attorneys who are going to be representing veterans on, on class action. So um, it, I understand what you're saying, and it's, uh, I, you know, I don't know all of the attorneys um, who are making the ads. I know some of them, yep. and they're good, you know, but I can't speak for everyone. So, you know, if you're looking for um, uh, advice or if you need to talk to someone about how that might affect you or your spouse, we're happy to consult with you again. That's free. We don't charge for a consultation or uh, the veteran service organizations, as we keep um, repeating, because really your VSOs, your county veteran services have uh, really great resources for you. So that's a good place to start, too. Um, but if you have specific questions like that, you know, again, we're happy to, to help you field them. Um, I don't know all of the lawyers who are advertising. I do know some, and like I said, they're really good attorneys, really good people, some that we work with, so yeah. Um, I, want, I want to um, give out a few little gifts and in, um, in wrap up, and I wanna honor your time. We will be here after if you wanna talk to us personally about um, any issues or something you didn't ask, but um, I, I really want to tell you, thank you for being here. I know um, at the bottom of the page, um, Jim Fasson was supposed to be here. He got called away, um, and uh, he, Jim served, um, and it was his vision 20-some years ago that he is an attorney, that our veterans weren't being taken care of. And so that was Jim's vision, and, um, and I'm so glad um, that he thought about this or and pursued it and has continued with it. And I really want to thank Beth today um, and the Canton Foundation for hosting the 13th Veterans um, Summit. We try different things to keep this going and I hope there will be a 14th. But I want to give out some um, little gifts um, before we part. And so I'll ask some questions and put up your hand and then I might ask you for a number. But do we have any, I, I know it's not the proper sequence, but do we have any Air Force veterans in the room? All right, so um, give me a number. 27. Ma'am? Okay. Speak. Okay. Um, the number I was thinking was 29, so please um, have him pick out one of these. I have, yes. All right, so that was Air Force. All right, where's the Marines? All right. Um, oh, this will be easy. Um, <laughs> Beth, which one did he pick? Okay, um, then offer him a choice between these two, the gentleman here in the second row. All right, where's the Marines? Okay, where uh, is uh, those, uh, where's the Navy? I know a couple right here. All right, sir, give me a number. Uh, 17. Okay. 17. Okay. Pardon me? Okay, um, the number was, if I got this right, you're the closest. Oh, maybe not. The number was 78. 72. You're 72, okay, pick one. Um, the books that we're passing out, I need to give him a little kudo, you'll see the name. Um, my husband, Jim, Jim Fasson was one of the authors um, on these collective, um, stories that were put out beyond belief. So um, I'm really proud of that. This second edition, he has some women that were represented in there, and there is a nurse. I wonder why he picked that one. <laughs> hey, Carol Ann, before- Very smart of him. Let me just jump in too to give people some, some bookkeeping. If they wanna get in touch with you, what's a phone number, what's the best way? Are your cards out here? How do we, how do we get them? to Ooh, get that information. Sure, the phone number is 800-693-4800. And on the table, we've got some magnets and some cards with the contact information. Um, for any of these eBooks, you can get them at our website, which is legalhelpforveterans.com. And we also have, um, if you're looking to inquire, you can do that through the website as well. Um, How about the, the new number? 
248. I don't know the 248 number by heart, Carolyn, but if they call the 800 number, it'll go right through. <laughs> and the reason we have a 1 800 is we're around the, the almost around the world, yeah. and so we want to make it available. For any of you, before I give the last couple, um, on the table are Vietnam books. Anything on the table, please take. Um, our business cards are there, the Vietnam book. Um, Jim, we're on Veterans Radio every Sunday night. And the fourth Sunday of the month um, is Veterans Benefits Night. And, um, and please call in, ask us questions. Um, we're out there. We're willing to help you. Um, so I think I have left. One more thing. Let me just Go jump ahead. in. And just to let you know, if you signed up and we have your email, we'll also be sending that out. And so that same information will be in the email that you'll receive from us as well. Okay. Okay. So I can't forget the army. Where's some army? <laughs> That's okay. Right. So, sir, number. 20. Okay. 75. Okay. 47. Okay. 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 The number was seven. The gentleman in the back. All right. Um, do I have any female veterans in the room? Excellent. Pick a number. Four. Okay. Twenty-two. Okay. You, it's 14. Beth, up front. Is he making a choice in back? So I have one book left. One book left. One book. This one's going to be easy. The longest service. So do I have somebody that served, I should say, anybody that served 20 years and you're able to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, do I have 20 years? Nobody? Reserves. Reserves, okay. Um, you've got a book. All right, so let's, let's do it this way. Um, Active duty service, 15 years. 10 years? Eight years? Six years? You got a book, you got a book, okay. Um, all right. Coast Guard? I know. Where's our spouses? Okay, we got quite a few. Um, if your veteran has served greater than reserves active duty, well, I think I got the answer for this one, greater than 10 years, is anybody around? Okay, five years. Four years. Okay, so I got three. All right, pick a number. Okay. 25. 32? We got another one back here. 15? 32. I was up at 92, so. <laughs> um, I, I really, I know Dave will wrap up, but I really want to thank you. I, um, it is an honor to be with you today. Um, thank you to our veterans. Thank you to your family. Um, please. Um, don't let something go. If, if you have a question, um, my title at the firm is CFO, and that's not Chief Financial Officer. It's Chief Fix-It Officer. I will help housing, education, your parents to get them aid in attendance. Um, I know the resources, um, and we've got awesome people to help you put your stories together. Um, to get you what you deserve and your family. So thank you for being here today. I don't know, Dave, if there's any more cleanup. Yep, just a little bit. I wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, since you, we have your email now, you'll receive information about future summits. So please feel free to come uh, there once a month. And I wanna thank our speakers today. Thank you so much. We will be hanging around for the next 30 minutes or so. If you have other questions or things you'd like to bring up with us, we're gonna be around. We'll end this session formally but we're here, so please feel free to come up to us and let's thank our speakers. Thank you.